Welcome back to Planet Zoo. Today with an inspirational capybara habitat build. We are going to go from planning to building to detailing. So you get all the three build blocks that I usually do and hopefully you can take out some tips and tricks out of this. But without further ado, let's get started with planning. And with today's music, I want to take you on a journey through Italy with my wonderful spring voice, 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 uh, which is exactly made by pollen allergy. So apologizing for that at this point. But we are going to have a wonderful episode today in which I'm going to talk you through the planning first. Then we are going to get into the uh, building phase and then we go into detail. I'm going to further elaborate on, on what's the difference between building and detailing because it's quite significant. But let's first of all talk about the planning. Now, I have chosen the spot between my South American house and the uh, orangutan area. Uh, let's say continental wise or like location wise they don't really belong really together It's more likely that this part of the zoo um, was built later and some of the more uh, Exciting, you know species uh, came in here and and so they decided to go to this very top area With the orangutan gardens because they are obviously very big and they are very uh, Spacious and they needed to have this certain you know location and I always had this blank space in between and I thought what the heck can I do over here and for so long I wanted to do these wonderful cute capybaras again because I just love them and I wanted to redo my approach uh, back in the day with giving them a wonderful barrel kind of pool and uh, I'm very happy that I succeeded in doing so even though with a little bit of a caveat but more about that later but the most important bit is at the beginning of every build I do I block out the sections. You can do, uh, you can see I'm, I'm already doing a lot about the pool over here, um, more than you usually would think in planning, but I need to have a feeling of how much space this area uh, requires and how much um, I can do with the planters and how much a traversable area will be ending up uh, in this habitat. So I'm starting relatively detailed for planning to be honest but um, I'm using bigger blocks okay so this is the this is the most important bit about planning use bigger blocks to really block out the areas that you most definitely will have blocked away this way you will already pretty early on in your build define what is going to be traversable and what not this way you will also avoid the problem of running into the traversable, traversable area issues later on. Uh, if you don't know what that is, each animal has an individual pathfinding in your habitat and depending on their capabilities of climbing inclines or being able to climb in general or, or swim or whatever, they have different abilities to go to certain areas of your habitat. It's defined by which materials you use and, and how steep the inclines are, how shallow the water is and so on and so forth. And the game will always calculate this in, in life. Uh, so as you throw in a lock, for example, the game will calculate if your animal can technically go or jump over the lock or if the lock is too much of an issue for them. So for example, if you have a tiny animal like uh, a prairie dog, let's say, they can't obviously jump over a lock, so you can use a lock already as a pretty solid barrier, while obviously a zebra or some or an elephant can just easily walk over it. Well, easily is kind of a thing with this game, but you know, you get the idea. And this is why I always, in the planning phase, try to be very um, focused on, on making sure that what I do um, is already pretty much taken up all the space that the habitat later on will take up as space anyway. So every area I plan out is already with the idea in mind that this is the sole part which may not be traversable. And this is why I put the path in the middle, define where my, uh, you know, where my bridge goes and I'm also going to define where certain elements of the habitat go and this is one of the last things I do over here I wanted to put down the most prominent of the barrels and this is the barrel pool for the capybaras in which they can go and have a little chill um, and hopefully let the hot water dripple on top of their heads and I tried various ways of doing so as you can see I took this little fountain over here which looks absolutely fantastic the problem though and you'll see that later on this has changed the problem is the barrel and this piece they do not count as water now this is not really that much of an issue anyways but the capybaras for whatever reason didn't recognize this as spot 
to uh, use this enrichment item of this little hot tap. So I needed to change this later on to get some actual water in. And also, my little trick of putting some oranges in, which are done with the tennis ball, as you'll see in a couple of seconds, um, doesn't really work out that well because the fountain is a solid piece. You can see that now by putting down the piece, you can see the ball is not in the water. It's actually rolling on top of the water and not even on the water, like there's even a couple of centimeters in between um, simply because the game doesn't recognize this as water per se it's just an effect um, and there is a invisible barrier on top of it and this is why it just didn't work out the way I wanted it you can see I tried to cover it up with a couple of tricks I did over here um, but yeah nothing of it really happened but at this point I was done with the planning I just slopped in the last uh, wall over here and at this point I knew exactly where my habitat is gonna go so you can see this is the outline of my habitat and from here on we're gonna take it to really build out the blocks now so I'm gonna take some more pieces and I knew exactly what the kind of style should be it's somewhat of a mixture of their original area which they are living in, in their nature but also tied in with Sicily as a style, but also with the uh, South American house that people are actually uh, coming out of. You know, in this house, we have the sloth, we have the um, capuchin monkey, I believe it is also as well. Or is it the sea monk? Actually, I think it's not even a South American uh, house. Was it the South e Asia house? I completely forgot. But we've got a couple of animals in there too. <laughs> um, and it just kind of fits um, into this space. And I, I really like the fact how it ties into the, the house itself. The house doesn't feel so detached anymore now. And this is what I wanted to achieve with this build. Um, using a lot of different wooden materials was really my target over here. Making sure to really capture the essence of, you know, Sicily and this area around here. Trying to avoid too many of the African influences here and really sticking to, you know, Italian, European vibes almost. Um, I mean, almost in, in terms of the Mediterranean vibes in Italy are pretty strong and also very influenced by, you know, different different kind of cultures that have been there along the time, like Roman culture, obviously, a bit of Greek culture, a bit of African style as well going in here. Uh, so you, you kind of have a versatility uh, to build this, but I wanted to stick as much as possible to what this zoo mostly is going for, and this is a pretty... Uh, pretty Sicilian style, but as always if there are people from this region Sicilian people in the comments watching this video First of all, hey, thank you for watching again. Hope you like this series still and uh, you you feel carried home uh, By the episodes. Uh, let me know in the comments down below if this still feels and uh, is believable You know at the end of the day remember this is a zoo So there is a certain freedom of doing things differently, but you know we plant wise and 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 color wise and soil and dirt wise we have to stick to what Sicily would be offering anyway so um, it's it's not like super super green you know there is a bit more sandy and and dirt available <laughs> uh, pretty much due to the fact that this it, it, during summer and so on can be pretty dry um, so that is something we need to keep in mind too but also the usage of stone is uh, very heavy um, you know, we also had some ruins already throughout this uh, entire build and I just wanted to do something different this time around and this is why I decided to really go into, you know, the building mode like that. Now, uh, you see me placing some trees right now and this is where I need to quickly talk about what separates the building phase from the detailing phase. Now, We've been planning at the beginning and blocking out the areas. That is step number one, what I usually do. And once you've done that, you are very much uh, into the next part of your build. And this is making sure to put certain things already in place. Which plants do you want to have in certain areas? Which kind of uh, details you want to have in, in terms of not detailing, but in terms of details? Which means which building pieces, which logs, for example, or if you want to have like a building in there even, put it back in. And also making sure to really gather all the different styles that you want to go for. This is very important to really get a feeling for how the habitat looks. And at the end of the building phase, you will be, I'd say, 85% done with your habitat. And 
Granted, many people wouldn't necessarily see the difference between the building face and the detailing face immediately. If you put these two pictures next to each other, like, you know, uh, the, the building face, end of building face and end of detailing face, normally, at the first glance, there is not really that big of, an, uh, big of a difference because the detailing face is really going into smaller bits, like some transitions, some blending areas, you know, areas between two elements of your habitat, making sure everything feels coherent, getting rid of certain little you know glitches or uh, incoherencies or just like little things that you're not happy with but at the end of the building phase your main look of the habitat should be defined which in our case is happening uh, just on screen right now you can see i'm putting even some greenery in i'm reorienting some of the some of the stones and so on and I'm putting in the facilities for the guest as well making sure to adjust the watercolor you know, accordingly, and then just putting in some last bits. And then we're going into the detailing phase. Now, as I, as I said, we are now done with the building phase. It looks pretty good, but at this point, it's where like the little details come in. This is where you use some decals, use some very tiny bits. And I'm gonna start over here with making sure to make this area look a lot more used. Um, at the very beginning, I'm just going to put some dirt effects in making sure that uh, some certain things are a bit more realistic. You know, we've got the moss on, on the water uh, front and realistically from there also moss would start growing up these uh, uh, concrete barriers. And then I thought, you know, this little beach vibe over here um, feels a little bit too strong, like the edge feels a little bit too harsh. And so I decided to put some rocks in to blend this nicely together so you don't really see that hard edge of the ground so quickly and I also decided to put some more of these wonderful uh, rock pieces in well actually these are these stalactites and stalactites or whatever pieces but they look fantastic um, and then I decided to use some more greenery and uh, some more darker greenery uh, to get some nice details in between of the rocks I used some moss on top of this wonderful log over here you know if it's raining for example the whole time and this is kind of a realistic rock log um, you would have the issue that things start to you know get some moss vibes and you know putting these things in because i wanted to make the habitat feel not completely brand new but just like a little bit aged then i had this wonderful tree um i use so often throughout the zoo so i wanted to get in some more consistency and as we have these trees growing here quite a lot we needed one in this habitat too and it also helped to blend in the building a bit nicer because the building the building felt a little bit detached at this point and so you can see i'm using some of the dirt pieces over here and to really make the building feel a bit more you know old and used and then i figured at this point i kind of needed something that secures the wall from the capybaras and you know i don't want to have the capybaras um, you know, snack on the wall or just rub themselves on the wall or so. A, that would potentially hurt them with like the stone sticking out because that's a stone wall. Um, and, and B, I didn't want to have the, you know, wall being destroyed by them. So I decided to go for a little bit of a wooden uh, element. And then I figured you need I need to do certain blending elements on the other side too. So I copied over the pieces and made sure that the other little um, water entry area looks pretty much uh, similar to the other ones. I also used a bit of uh, terrain paint to blend in areas a bit nicer. Um, and then I figured I needed a bit more of uh, shrubbery here and there and also some more little details like for example putting down some oranges in a little basket over here um, which they could potentially feed from. And uh, yeah, as of now, you can also see that this barrel over here has already changed. Um, there is now a proper water volume in there made by barriers. And I figured at the end of the time, we also needed some pottery because at the end we are in Sicily and we need some of these terracotta pots. This is just what it is all about. Uh, and you know, just gonna quickly fill them in. Nothing too crazy, just making sure that everything looks fine um, and, and getting really into the super small details, making like a custom little curb over here, um, ensuring that this is uh, properly framed. And I was really, really happy with it. And so I just decided to get a little bit of a little step in here to make it a bit more interesting to look at and you can really tell how these little things now blend this all together making sure to put some of these pieces in. I wonder this little grass piece it's definitely a grass piece but it looked a little bit like lavender and uh, actually I'm really missing out on some proper lavender pieces or lavendula how, how do you say it in English whatever I think you guys know a lavender it's what you say lavender it's lavender brown from Harry Potter I should have known uh, lavender pieces that's that's what I was uh, thinking about but yeah um, <clears throat> 
I think they look more like uh, Lavender than the actual Lavender piece does, so this is why. And at the end, putting some locks in, making sure like some areas look like. You can also see I have, um, you know, put the little leaf pieces everywhere around to also make sure that some of the uh, foliage realistically lost some leaves, so you have them on the ground too. Like, it, it wouldn't be cleaned every single day, so that's why. And obviously, whenever you want to make something realistic, put some needle in or nettle, however you call that in English, because that shit grows everywhere, and so in your zoo. But just put it down. It's, unfortunately, it's there, but it also adds some bits of realism. And yeah, last but not least, throwing some decals in, and we are done with this wonderful habitat. I really hope you enjoyed this little journey through Italy today, uh, finishing this off with a wonderful cinematic. And if you want to have more inspiration and more tips and tricks like that, I would highly recommend to click to the top card right now because there certainly is a video for you that you may want to watch now to get more inspiration for you plan zoo builds. And I'm very, very interested to see what you guys come up with. Talk to you in the next one. Bye.